Well, you knew this was gonna be a PC case option eventually. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and today I've got a real treat for you. I'm checking out the Johnsbow D31 Mesh SC Micro ATX case, and man, let me tell you, I've never had so much chatter in the comments about a case. I got a ton of requests to review this after I did a review of a similar case, the Asus AP211, a few months back. And since Johnsbow really impressed me with their V11 case, I figure I had to give the D31 a try. Now, with the popularity of LCD displays and sensor panels and gaming rigs these days, it was only a matter of time before his case manufacturers started incorporating directly into the cases, and it looked like John's bow is leading the charge with the D31. But is it worth the $150 I paid for it? We're gonna take a deep dive into all the specs and features, see what fits in the case and what doesn't, go over my build notes, check out some thermal performance, and wrap things up by weighing the pros and cons to see if the D31 is a good value for a micro ATX enclosure. Let's kick it off with the specs and features. The D31 has dimensions of 440 millimeters deep by 205 millimeters wide by 363 millimeters tall for a total volume of 33 liters. It can accommodate CPU tower coolers up to 168 millimeters, graphics cards up to 400 millimeters, and ATX power supplies up to 200 millimeters. The case comes with zero fans, but can accommodate one rear and one front mounted 120 millimeter fans and up to three 120 millimeter or two 140 millimeter fans on the top and on the bottom of the case. The case supports liquid cooling with the ability to top mount up to a 360 millimeter radiator or a uh, there is a mounting location for a 3.5 inch hard drive on the bottom of the case, as well as two two and a half inch SSD mounting trays behind the motherboard. There are multiple tie down points and up to 35 millimeters of space for cable management. The front IO includes a 10 gigabit type C port, a five gigabit type A port, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and a power button ringed with a power indicator light. The left side panel is made of clear tempered glass and the right side panel is powder coated steel, both of which can easily be removed without tools. The top panel is made of full steel mesh as is the lower front panel. The rear of the case includes four bridged PCIe expansion ports and there's a full coverage magnetically attached dust filter on the bottom of the case. And finally, mounted directly to the front of the case is an eight inch IPS display. The display has a resolution of 1280 by 800, a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, and is USB powered with a single mini HDMI input. Just like the panels, the display has toolless installation and can be used externally with the included mesh panel to cover the opening on the front of the case. I'll get into the setup and use of the display as well as some of the considerations in its use in a bit, but let's go over some of my build notes. First, this is the third case in this form factor I've reviewed in the past few months, and compared to the ASUS AP201 and Inwin A3, while it's the most expensive, the D31 is definitely the cheapest when it comes to materials, build quality, and finish. The case is constructed from 20 or 21 gauge steel, which is on the thin side for a PC case. The tolerances are pretty wide with large and uneven gaps between the panels. The toolless panels are a nice feature, but after pulling the side panel off for just the third time, one of the plastic retention clips broke. I assume John's bow knew this was a problem as luckily they included two spares with it in the hardware. Also, the powder coat finish is thin and uneven. This doesn't show up on camera really well, but under my studio lights, I can definitely see lighter and darker areas of the finish on the top and right steel panels. Now, despite the build quality, which I'll address a little bit more in a bit, the build went together smoothly. There's plenty of room around the motherboard for all the cables to fit without issue. My 165 millimeter tower cooler and 335 millimeter graphics card fit without problems. However, with any smaller form factor case, you do need to plan properly for a build. For example, if you go with a 360 top mounted AIO, you'll need to drop the PSU down, which reduces the max graphics card length from 400 to just 335 millimeters. Even with the PSU raised, there will still be the cables under it to contend with, so I wouldn't try stuffing an ROG Strix 4090 card in here. Another consideration is AIO thickness. While there is plenty of RAM clearance, if your AIO is much thicker than the standard 55 millimeters, the VRM heatsink heights above 30 millimeters will be a problem. Also, if you use bottom mounted fans, 
graphics card thickness and placement is a consideration. My 6750 XT is only a two and a quarter slot card, but because it's installed in the second PCI slot due to my motherboard's M.2 slot placement, there's less than 20 millimeters of space left between the fans. This case does, however, have more vertical interior space than either the AP201 or the A3. While the semi-modular PSU helped, cable management was easy. With just a few zip ties, I was able to keep everything tied down well enough not to interfere with the pop-on side panel. There was also the fact that there were no case fans to manage, but for testing, I did add a basic 120 DC rear case fan, and I got thermals that were a little higher than the other MATX cases, with peak CPU temps of 72 degrees Celsius above ambient, VRM temps of 23.5 degrees above ambient, and GPU peak temps of 54 degrees above ambient. Now, while that covers most of my usual case review points, I know the vast majority of people considering this case is because of the built-in display. So let's look at that a little more closely. Now, the first thing to know is this is a USB powered HDMI display. It comes with a USB-A to USB-C cable and a mini HDMI to HDMI cable, which routes from the front of the case behind the motherboard and then out through the bottom PCIe slot, which is modified with a couple of cable notches. And then it plugs into an HDMI port on the graphics card and a USB port on your motherboard. So you will need an open HDMI port and less critically an open USB port. There's also no proprietary software for the screen. It's simply a secondary display that you activate in your operating system. From there, you can use it just like any other display. Now, if you wanna run something like Wallpaper Engine or a sensor panel like this, you'll need to pay for those. Wallpaper Engine you can get from Steam for like four bucks and it's a neat little app or you can just do something like loop a video for a similar effect. But A to 64 will cost you $60 if you wanna run a sensor panel. There are cheaper and even free programs for this, but nothing is advanced or as customizable as the A to 64 panel. John's Boat does provide a basic 1280 by 800 A to 64 panel template in several colors. So you can get up and running with a panel pretty quickly. There are a lot of videos out there on how to set up and customize these panels. There are a ton of resources to find free or paid panels. I bought this one, this template for five bucks and just made a few quick edits. So I had something pretty cool looking to show on this video. Now, regardless of how you wanna use the screen and despite the overall quality of the rest of the case, the display is really nice. Really high pixel density, nice size and aspect ratio, and it's even 60 Hertz, which really isn't necessary unless you want to like game on it. I mean, after all, it's the same specs as the Steam Deck display, but an inch bigger. I mean, actually gaming on your actual gaming PC. I mean, it could be a thing, but seriously, I can't comment on long-term reliability of the screen, but if you look at the cost difference between the D31 mesh without the screen and the screen version, it's about $60, which is a great price for an HDMI display with these specs. In fact, it's cheap when compared to other comparable displays you can buy separately. So after testing out the John's Bow D31 Mesh SC, my overall conclusion is that it's a good case, easy to build in, holds larger modern components, has pretty good thermals with just one fan, and keep in mind there's room for up to seven more. However, it might be a little overpriced just based on materials and build quality. The version without the built-in screen retails for around $80 to $90, but given the lightweight steel and mediocre build quality and lack of any included fans, I feel like this case is more in the 60 to $70 range, which is what it actually sells for on AliExpress. Keep in mind though, when you buy it in North America, you also have to factor in additional costs like shipping tariffs and general inflationary fees. While it might not be as much of a value compared to the similar cases from Inwin or Asus, the John's Boat does have a unique feature a built-in relocatable high def display. As far as I know, there are no other cases currently on the market with this option. So in that sense, I think the price is fair. Just be sure to plan your build carefully and budget for any additional components or software you might need like, you know, case fans. So what do you guys think of the John's Bow D31 Mesh SC? Is the display worth the extra cost? And if so, what would you use it for? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.